Good evening and welcome back to our Parsha webcast. This week's Parsha is again a double portion, the portions of Achri Mois and Kedoshim. To give a synopsis of these two portions, the whole class is going to go away just on the synopsis itself because it's a very uh, detailed, a lot of details in this, especially the second one. But nevertheless, I'm going to give you a, a basic overview. The portion begins with the laws of Yom Kippur. Not the laws of Yom Kippur, but the service in the temple of Yom Kippur. It tells Aaron, the high priest, how to observe the service in the temple on the holiest day of the year, and that he had to uh, have two sets of clothing. One was known as the white clothing, one was known as the gold clothing. And uh, the, the, when he did the service inside the temple proper, meaning in the inner sanctuary, in the inner the the uh, in the offering of the incense, and going into the holiest room, the holy of holies, he was to wear white clothing, linen white clothing. But the vest, he was not to wear the vestments that were made specifically for the high priest, as we learned in the book of Exodus the eight specific uh, garments that were made for the high priest, were, which were made with gold threads as well, that he was not to wear in the when he went in to do the highest level of the, the, the most important parts of the Yom Kippur service. Why not? Very simple. It's based on the principle that a prosecutor cannot become a defending lawyer. Meaning... What was the reason that we needed atonement? Because of the sin of the golden calf. So the gold became our biggest prosecution, became our problem. The gold is the the cause of our need for atonement. So it makes no sense to use gold, to go use golden clothing to go in and get atonement for for the golden calf. So en kateger nasis aneger. A prosecution cannot become serve as the defense. So therefore, being that gold was our prosecution, we are sinned with gold, we're not going to use gold to defend ourselves and get atonement, so we wore white clothing. White also represents cleanliness and angelic, and that's why we wear white on Yom Kippur, we wear a special white kittle, and that uh, resembles the angels. And therefore, I, again, I would encourage all the men to wear a kittle on Yom Kippur. It's important. And he moves on from that. Uh, part of the Yom Kippur service was to bring two, bo- two goats. One goat was to be brought as a sacrifice inside the temple. One goat was to be sent off to the cliff as atonement for the Jewish people. And the Torah describes Yom Kippur as the day, the Achaz Bashona, the one day of the year, that one unique day of the year. And indeed, it is a unique day, it's special, it's the holiest day, treated with special uh, holiness. The second half of the portion discusses, it's almost like a complete, complete opposite, it discusses the prohibitions against immoral sexual um, uh, intimacy, um, who you're allowed to marry, who you're not allowed to marry, uh, all the laws against... um, incest and uh, homosexuality and uh, other um, laws regarding that uh, that area of life. So it goes from the highest, if you will, from the highest portion from you, the holiness of Yom Kippur to such base laws, which is an interesting contrast. And it's interesting also that both of these half portions we read on Yom Kippur the, the morning we read about the service of Yom Kippur, and the afternoon by Mincha we re- read about the, the se- about these uh, forbidden sexual relationships. And the I guess the, the the message there is because the Torah is teaching us that you can be in the highest moment, but if it doesn't translate into basic moral behavior, you're nobody. You're not. It's nothing. Then the second portion is the portion of Kedoshim. It talks, like I said, almost every verse is another law. You should read it, spend time on it. In this portion we have the famous mitzvah of love your fellow as yourself. 
to love every Jew as you love yourself. And uh, if you remember, we gave a whole long class on that uh, subject itself and uh, many other laws. So I'm not going to give you a synopsis of Kedoshim because that would be every verse is another, uh, another law. Not quite, but almost. So now I want to zero in on a verse in this portion and I'm going to teach you some Rambam tonight. The Torah tells us as follows. I'm going to read to you five verses. God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am God, do not follow the ways of Egypt where you once lived, nor, nor of Canaan where I will bring you, meaning Israel, the, you know, the land of Canaan. You should not follow in their ways. Do not follow any of their customs because they're idol worshippers and they have customs that is not, you're not allowed to emulate. Follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. For I am God your Lord. Keep my decrees and laws since it is only by keeping them that a person can truly live. I am God. Now, the translation, a lot of times in the translation, a lot gets lost. And this is one case where in the translation some important uh, aspects of this verse got lost. In the Hebrew it reads, Ushmar, you should guard my, uh, you should uh, keep my decrees and laws that a man, Ashaya, that, the per, uh, that the person should do. And then it says, Vachai Bahem and you shall live by them. The rabbis have learned from this verse, from these two words, v'chaibem, you shall live by them, one of the most important laws of Judaism, and that is that the Torah and the mitzvahs were given to live by them, meaning that if God forbid doing the mitzvah would cost you your life, you should not do the mitzvah. And from there, we, because the order was given to live by them, not to die by them. In the words of our sages, to live by them, but not to die by them. That means if a mitzvah becomes a threat to your life, you should not do it. You should violate the mitzvah and live. Mm -hmm. For example, it's known the, 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 that is the basis for the law, that pikuach nefesh, a matter of life and death, cancels out all the mitzvahs of the Torah. For that reason we have the law that, if, for example, you're sitting in your house on Shabbos and someone collapses and you live far away from a hospital, you can't just carry him to the hospital. There's no way room. And you can't walk there five miles away. And by the time you get to the hospital, he's going to die if you walk. So what should you do? You're not allowed to use a phone on Shabbos. You and you're not allowed to get into a car on Shabbos. So, should you let, so, so, you, so should, what do you do here? The, the, the mitzvah now, Shabbos, became a threat to your life. You if you observe Shabbos, you're going to die. So in that case, the law is that you violate Shabbos and you go to the hospital. And the truth, it's also true with every, every other law. If you're going to die of starvation, and the only food you have is a piece of pork, treif, treif of food. So again, the, the, now you're going to either, if you keep the mitzvah of keeping kosher, you're going to die. So you don't keep the mitzvah of kosher, you eat anything that comes to your mouth and you live. Okay, that's, everyone knows that law, that if it comes to life and death, you have to live. Okay. I thought that if it's in public though. It's like wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I want to discuss this it, this topic tonight because there's a lot of misconception with this topic first of all this is true with 610 of the mitzvahs mm -hmm. there are three mitzvahs that even if you are at the, at the threat of life you're not allowed to violate those three mitzvahs which are they of course one is idol worship mm -hmm. another one is immoral sexual mm -hmm. acts or in, uh, forbidden sexual relations, and murder, of course. That means as follows. 
if someone takes a gun and points it to your head and says, Sir, you're going to either violate the Shabbos or I kill you right now. What should you do? Violate the, violate the Shabbos. I'm going to, if you either lie or steal or I kill you, you should lie, you should steal, you should do anything to save your life. But if he tells you, I'm going to, I'm going to with the same threat, I will kill you if you don't worship this idol, if you don't bow down to this to the cross, oh, now is a different. This is a different ball game. Over here, the Torah tells you under no circumstances shall you ever serve another god. An idol is out of the question, even if it means you should die. It's better to die than to worship an idol, even if it's not, even if you don't really mean it inside. Meaning, the guy is forcing you to do it, right? So you're doing it, it's only an external act. You're bowing to the cross, but you don't really believe in it. You're bowing to the idol, you don't believe in it. So how bad is that? Right? You're not even believing in it. So should you do it or not? No. The answer is you're not allowed to do it. That's the law. And the same thing if someone tells you, I'm going to kill you if you'll murder Yankel. Either you kill Yankel or I kill you. What should you do? Of course you shouldn't kill Yankel. You can't kill him to save your life. Can you kill the guy who told you to do it? In, every, in no, all cases you're allowed to. Huh? In all cases you're allowed to. Yeah, no, no joke. If, if someone is threatening your life yeah. to worship an idol and you have the ability to kill him before he kills you, yeah. sure you should kill him. No doubt about that. That's self-defense. Okay, that's permitted. That's permitted. Not only is it permitted, it's an obligation. Yeah. It's a very big difference between permitted and an obligation. It's a moral obligation to kill him before he kills you. Over here, compassion is not is, 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 is not in place. You don't have compassion on a person that's looking to kill you. You kill him first. That's an absolute moral obligation. Not only that, but you should kill the person if you see him threatening someone else. Right. You have a moral obligation to kill that person before he kills the other person. Okay, that's obvious. That's true in our law, in the system of, of secular law as well. And the same thing is with forbidden sexual relations. If someone puts a gun to your head and says, if you don't cohabit with this and with this woman who is forbidden, I'm going to kill you, you have to let yourself die. It's clear, yeah? Right? Any questions? What? It's clear, okay. I have a question yeah. on the uh, idol worship. Isn't that what the whole uh, Mesiris Nefesh, where um, you had large portion of, let's just say, like the conversos? Okay, so don't that. I'm going to get to there. You, well, uh, when we're finished, if uh, you didn't, oh, yeah, I didn't, I'm going to address that. I'm going to address it. Now, now, the, another, now there's a, di a different question that I want to ask before I address your question. What happens if someone comes to you and says, I'm going to kill you if you don't violate the Shabbos? So what we say, the law is that in that case you violate the Shabbos because the Torah wants you to live by the mitzvahs, not, cause, not that they should cause you to die. But what happens if someone says, I want to be super religious? And I want to sacrifice my life and not violate the Shabbos. To me, I can't violate the Shabbos. It's too much. I can't do it. So if it means dying, I'll die. But I can't violate the Shabbos. Shabbos is too important to me. I know that the Torah permits me to violate the Shabbos. But do, am I obligated to die? Or may I, take my, may, may I observe the law and... No. How do you know? Because it's not your body. There's a, there's a dispute in halacha about that. <clears throat> there's a dispute in halacha about that. If you're allowed to go on Mesiris Nefesh for other mitzvahs, if you're allowed to sacrifice your life for mitzvahs other than those three. Okay? Now, in next week's portion, there's a mitzvah that says that God commands and demands of us, expects from us to sanctify His name. Kiddush Hashem it's called. 
The sanctification of God's name. What does it mean to sanctify God's name? To hold, to hold it holy. What does that to mean? Fight for what is the practical? The practical. To fight for it. To defend it. To. If you're ready to die for it. Let's yeah, not get into a guessing ready. game. Yeah. Let's see what the Rambam says. What is Kiddush Hashem? What does it mean to sanctify God's name? Usually we translate it as giving up your life for, for, for God's name. That's what Kiddush Hashem means, to give up your life for God's name. When, do you, when are you supposed to give up your life for God's name? We just said the only time you're supposed to give up your life for God's name is in three specific laws, mitzvahs. Against uh, those mitzvahs, someone threatens your life if you, if, you, if you don't worship idols, and you don't kill, and you don't commit sexual, um, uh, forbidden re sexual relations, you have to die instead of doing it. And that is called Kiddush Hashem. That is called sanctifying God's name. You're ready to give up your life for Hashem. That means you're so dedicated to God that even at the cost of life you were ready to give. You, you, you know, you did it. Is that what Kiddush Hashem means? It does. But let me read to you a little bit from Rambam. He gives us a whole different twist on this. But in the process, he tells us a lot of interesting laws as well that we need to know. The Rambam says like this. First of all, regarding the law that we just said, that, that all the mitzvahs you should violate rather than die, there are a number of conditions that have to be met. It's not so simple. For example, Rambam says as follows, when does the above apply that you should let yourself violate the mitzvah and not die in the, in, in the other 610 mitzvahs, Right? when the Gentile who's threatening you desires his own personal benefit. For example, he comes to you and says, I need my house built today. So I don't know how to build a house, and you do, so I'm telling you, either you build my house or I'm killing you. And it's Shabbos. So what should you do, die? No, you should build a house for the guy and not let yourself die. Because in this case, he means for his benefit. He's doing it for his own benefit. He needs a house. He wants you to build it for him. Or he needs food. He's hungry. He doesn't know what to eat. And he doesn't know how to cook. You do know how to cook. So he tells you, you're coming right now and cooking me a meal. If not, I'm killing you. So in that case, you should cook the meal. Even though cooking a meal on Shabbos is an absolute violation, you should do it. But... However, if his intention, this is crucial, is solely to have him violate the mitzvahs, he just, he hates Jews. He just wants you to break Shabbos. He doesn't need you to break Shabbos, not for his benefit. He just likes to see a Jew break Shabbos. He wants to show you that I'm not going to let you be religious. Then the whole thing changes. Then the law is a different law. The following then applies. If he is alone and there are not ten other Jews present, he does. He comes into your house and there's no one around. It's just you and him. He says, you're going to violate the Shabbos. I don't need this, but I'm going to make you violate the Shabbos. Then you should violate the Shabbos. If it's just between you and him, there's no one watching, you should do it. Okay? However, if he forces him to transgress with the intention that he violate a mitzvah in the presence of ten Jews, this is a public display now. This became a public issue. He should sacrifice his life and not transgress. That's the law. This applies even if the Gentile intended merely that he violate only one of the Torah's only one of the Torah's mitzvahs. Meaning even not those three mitzvahs. Okay?
Clear, yeah? yeah, yeah. Now, this is not this is not done yet. All the above distinctions apply only in times other than times of a decree. In a regular time, it's quiet, there's no fights between Jews and Gentiles, it's, not, it's just a regular time, one guy's a, a evil guy, he wants to prove that he can get a Jew to violate a mitzvah, so he goes and does that. So then, if you're in private, you violate, you don't die, if you're in public, you die. But, in times of a decree, in other words, when a wicked king, like Nebuchadnezzar, or Stalin, or the like, yeah, where they, they went and uh, intentionally battled against Jewish life. They wanted to uproot Judaism. That was their intention. The Greeks, the Vuchadnezar and others. And they issue a decree against the Jews to nullify their faith. Or one of the mitzvahs. They say, from now on, no Jew is allowed to circumcise. Or no Jew is allowed to eat in a sukkah. They made such a decree. Would not allow a sukkah anymore. Then the whole equa- the whole thing changes. One should sacrifice one's life rather than transgress any of the mitzvahs, whether one is compelled to transgress amid others ten Jews in public, he or he is compelled it, it, it alone. There's so no that's Jews only public. in times of persecution. Yeah, so if it's times not of, time persecution, of persecution and there's ten Jews, you don't. Then have you have to, to die. You if do. If the, yes. You always have to let yourself die if you're in public. Mm-hmm. And the guy is doing it only intentionally to make you violate the Shabbos. He has no benefit from it. But if it's in public, he wants you to build his house because he needs a house. That's different. That's different. And if the other ten Jews don't help you. <laughs> well, here it's just ten Second, Jews. I want to make sure that you understand this. However, if there is a time of decree, you have to, even if you're not in front of any other Jews, yeah. he's, probably, he's doing it to, to you just to... You have to sacrifice your life. And the truth is, it says, you don't like this. No, no, this, no, is talk, I, I, this is halacha. This is halacha. Yeah, yeah, no, this is halacha. I was this is halacha. Because before he said that the, the Torah says that only for three mitzvot you can, but, you but have to die. Special, but then now, there's special circumstances. There's circumstances, yeah. But this, this yeah. is besides what the Torah says. Yeah. The that, Torah is talking about it here. That's the rabbinical oral law. One second, this is the oral law. But I'm telling you, what the Torah is talking about over there is, for examples, I gave you. I gave you the example. You, you, you had a heart attack on Shabbos. Should you violate the Shabbos and save your life? Of course, you should violate the Shabbos and save your life. We're not talking about that over here. We're talking about where goyim are trying to force Jews to violate their religion. That means the the very religion is on the line. You can't allow that. So those cases, even the smallest minhag, you have to die for. That's the law. Hmm. Only if there's ten Jews, though. No, no, no. Okay. No, if it's a decree against Judaism, it makes no. The ten doesn't apply. There's no decree, and there's just the five. Then you don't have to. Then you should live. Even if it's public, I don't understand. A public is, is, is public. I said if it's public, then you have to die. If it's not public, then you don't die. Ten is public. The, the definition of public here is if there's ten, ten Jews around. There has to be ten and, Jews. And if there's a hundred Gaim and no Jews. No, that's not public. That's public to me. It's not a time of decree. So they're not, it's not a decree against Judaism. He's having fun with a Jew. He's trying to break a Jew down. He's doing it in front of God. Let don't die. But if you have to not to break the Shabbat, you're entitled to do it anyway, right? Say, no, I still don't want to do it. If when? When you're just in front of one, not in public. It says, the Rambam says that you should violate the Shabbat. But how about if you just don't want to because you're... Extremely religious person. Okay, so, so no, I said before this, there's different opinions public. about that. Rambam holds that you're not allowed to let yourself die. You can't be religious, super religious in that case. You have to live by them. You have to because, live by them. So that will be going against That's the like committing suicide. Right, right. that's right. right. Yeah. That's what the Rambam holds. Because your body really doesn't belong to but you. In the, the time of decree, but there's other opinions about this. But in this, the time yeah? of decree, 
You know, at the time of the decree, everyone agrees you have to give your life up for even the smallest minute. Okay. Mm. Even if you're in private. Chances are you're going to die No, chances are no. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. In communist Russia, communist Russia, if you gave up Judaism, they didn't kill you. They didn't. But if you didn't give up Judaism, if you fought them and you kept Judaism, they would, many times, they would kill you. Send you away for 10 years and you'll die, for star you'll die and star from starvation or whatever. The Rebbe's father is a perfect example. The Rebbe's father. He died. In exile, he was arrested for being, for, for fighting the government, not giving up Judaism. And they sent him to a uh, place where there was no way he could survive. But and he didn't survive. But his, his wife with him, grabbed Rebbe's His wife went and, with him. And she, she gone with him at the beginning, or she, she, she went, went after him? Right away, she went with him right away. She went with him right away. Well, he was in jail for, yeah. say, eight, nine months first. Right. She oh, didn't well. know where he was. Oh, it's a whole story. It's not important right. for right now. But, and there were hundreds of such chassidim, maybe thousands. Who died? And that's Kiddush Hashem. So the principle is that God wants us to live by the mitzvahs. And that goes in line with the whole purpose of creation. The whole purpose of creation is here on earth. God wants to be here on earth. We learned this in Tanya, we learned this every other mimer that we learn. The purpose of all of creation was to create a dwelling place for Hashem here on earth. That's where He wants everything. That's where it, it all happens. A mitzvah down here is where God's essence is revealed. In heaven, God's essence is not revealed. We learned that many times. That's why religions that believe that the, the heaven is better than earth, and, uh, we don't believe that. Islam believes that, Christianity believes that, heaven is a better place than earth. What we believe is that heaven is a more pleasurable place than earth, but earth is where mu is much more important, much more godliness is revealed here on earth when a person lives according to God's will than heaven can ever experience. And therefore, we live, we don't die. Mm -hmm. So the Torah, the whole purpose of the Torah mitzvah is to reveal God down here. <coughs> That's why the Torah commands us, v'chaibem, you should live by it. Because this is where God's essence is going to be revealed if you do mitzvahs. <coughs> and if you're going to die, not violating this Shabbos, the principle is, violate this Shabbos so you should be able to observe 30 others. 100 others, or 300, or so many Whatever. others. But there's conditions. If there's three mitzvahs, life loses meaning if you violate those three mitzvahs. <coughs> if you murder someone else, you'll, you have no right to live. And to worship idols goes against the whole, the whole concept of creation anyway. Mm. And, immor and, and the forbidden sexual relations is, 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 is just like murder. When you say sexual relations, sexual immorality... Is that including adultery? That sure. Yeah, sure. Is it? It's adultery. Absolutely. Yeah. It's adultery. But not only adultery. Not only adultery. You don't violate other people because you want to live. So you don't do that. That's not that it goes against the grain of uh, human logic. Okay. But then if Judaism itself is under threat then God says, we have to fight for it. You have to do whatever it takes to uphold Judaism. If the very godly moral code is on, is on the line, they're trying to destroy it, then the only way to save it is by death. Die. Because what gain do we have if you're going to live, if the whole Judaism goes down the drain? So in those cases, God says over there, you have to die. That I expect from you. What about now, the cases the, the, of, of, of rape? Where are there cases of rape? What do you mean? If, you're, if, if the gun is held to your head and yeah. you're 
I'm just giving a, an example of that. I don't know yeah, of any cases that that, that happened. Yeah. But the Rambam gives an example. If someone says, I'm going to die if I don't have relations with this woman. Please bring her to me. And the doctor confirms it. And the doctor says, yeah, he will die if we don't give him this woman. Yeah, should you, should you give him this woman? Of course not. What? That's... That's what? That's not realistic. Not what is realistic? What is realistic? Rape cases are, are reality. That's no, no, no. We're talking about a person should die and not commit. You're saying the woman should die. You're yeah. talking about the woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, she should let herself die right. instead of committing. Right. Uh, right. He's, he's not asking. No, uh, rape cases so. is a different yeah, case. Different. Yeah. Rape case, he's not killing you. He's just trying to rape you. You know, if you can fight him off. And I know of a case. I know of a case. In Crown Heights, it happened in Crown Heights. A young man came in, broke into a woman's house where there was a woman there. Her name is Pesha Lapine. In 1992, this happened. In January of 92, broke into her house. And he, you know, his, his, he, that's, he wanted to violate her. And she fought him off and he killed her. He murdered her. That's Kiddush Hashem. That's a perfect example of a, of a woman that gave her life up. The Rebbe, I want you to know something, that it made such a, it broke the Rebbe so bad that that story broke, the, the Rebbe was so affected by it, he spoke about it a number of times, about this woman in such detail. What does it mean a mother who's going to give up her kids to be educated by other people? How the kids are, and she knows the kids are going to miss her and grow up without her. And, and, and she's going to miss them. And she, this is all going through her mind while this, is, this terrible event is happening. Yet she gave it all up for Hashem. The Rebbe stole this woman. I never heard the Rebbe speak about a woman's greatness like I heard in this case. But that happens. Yes, that is a real case. So Rabbi, what was the justification for giving up your life in terms of religious persecution? You, you that is the justification. You have to give up your life in, 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 a, in an event of religious persecution. Because why yeah. you don't preserve your life? Because no. Because the, the, the God himself is on, the, is on the attack. The whole, if God himself, they're trying to destroy Judaism, destroy, the, you know, destroy God's whole program for, for life, for the world, then God says, fight it. Over there you can't, uh, you can't, you can't allow yourself to live. Now, we do know she asked before, in the case of the, uh, in the Inquisition, for example, the Spanish Inquisition, when they forced Jews to convert, we know that the, uh, most Jews did not give up their life. They did convert, at least outwardly. outwardly. They violated a mitzvah. There's no question about it. They did the wrong thing. Should we judge them? Should we? It's not our place to judge. Who knows how we would behave under those circumstances. So the last thing you want to do is judge anyone. Mm. And there was a big debate about that, by the way, in the, in the, uh, the rabbis, when they left, when they finally kicked out and they managed to leave Spain and they came to other communities and they rejoined the Jewish people, a lot of their former colleagues were very, very unwelcoming. I gave everything up and you stayed because you wanted to preserve your businesses and your money. See, the Christians gave, their, they, they, they gave Jews the option to leave Spain with nothing, with the shirt on your back, that's it. You couldn't take anything with you. So there was a big test. They didn't, they didn't kill you necessarily. They said either you convert and then you stay in Spain or leave with nothing. A lot of Jews left. A lot of Jews remained. And said, we'll be closet Jews. But then after a while they, you know, they were caught and they had to escape anyway. So they escaped or they left. They found it. You know, a lot of them left later. So they lived like Christians outwardly for a few years and then they left and rejoined Judaism when they came to a new community. They came to Poland or they came wherever. So now, they met up with their old neighbors, right? 
he gave up his, his house, his business, his for savings, everything to sanctify God's name and not convert to Christianity, left everything behind. His neighbor converted to Christianity and lived the life, the good life. Now he wants to come and rejoin the Jewish people and get an aliyah, you know, he wants to get mafted. He wants to, you know, they should honor him in the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah. That wasn't simple, as you can well imagine. But the rabbis of the time, the leading rabbinic literature of the time, all point in the direction of accepting these Jews back. Because they were forced. It's not so, you know, you're, you're right, they didn't do it, what the Torah tells them. But it was a force. It wasn't, you know, they didn't do it with their, you know, because they wanted to. It was forced in them. So now that they have the opportunity to become Jewish again, you have to open your arms. You have to open your doors for them. And that has been the case with the Rambam as well. In his time also, the Yemenite Jews were also forced to convert. And then they wanted to rejoin Judaism. And there were a lot of rabbis of the time that said, no way under the sun are we accepting you, you gave it all up, go be, be a Christian, or whatever it was then. The Rambam was, wrote scathing letters against these rabbis. Mm. What kind of leaders are you who made you into leaders? You don't, real strong language. Mm. How could you tell Jews that they shouldn't return to Judaism? So th it's a double, you know, this, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing. So yeah, when you're forced, you can't judge people. But the law, we know, the law is the law. So therefore, the chassidim in Russia, yeah, they all gave up their life. Not everyone did. The, the, a lot of the Orthodox Jews in Russia left, or they gave it up, and they, you know, they weren't. You know, the, rabbi, the previous rabbi and his chassidim did heroic acts. The previous rabbi lost his, almost lost his life. They sentenced him to death. It was with miracles that they overturned it and they sent him in freedom. But they were ready for, for death. And many of them died. Many, many, thousands, hundreds, and maybe thousands of Hasidim that died on Al Kiddush Hashem. But the question now is when you talk about Kiddush Hashem, and I want to give another few minutes, what is the real Kiddush Hashem? What does it mean? God, is God's name sanctified when a Lubavitch Rebbe is, gets killed because he didn't because he was Jewish? No, not necessarily. Not to the public eye. What kind of a Kiddush Hashem is that, really, between me and you? Is God's name sanctified when that happens? I don't feel it. When Jews die because they're Jewish, does that sanctify God's name or desecrates God's name? What does it do to the world when they watch? The world that watches and says, wait a minute. These are people that are devoted to God and God's not there to protect them. They're dying. But it does so what, does that really does that promote Judaism? or that, does, that, does that sell God well or that no, uh, undermines sell. God? It doesn't sell God well. It doesn't really sell God. What it does is it sells that Jew. In other words, the Kiddush Hashem over here is the Jews' neshama sanctified God's name. He sanctified God's name. Is God's name sanctified by this? So the Rambam says that is something very interesting. The Rambam says that when a Jew is ready to die for God and God then saves him by a miracle or whatever some circumstance happens that he somehow escapes death that's a Kiddush Hashem. For example he gives examples with the three great prophets, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in the Bible, where they were forced by Nebuchadnezzar, or Daniel, was slowed to the lion's den, they were thrown into a furnace, those three, because they didn't want to deny God. And what happened when they were in the furnace? They, a miracle happened. They died, they lived. Now when the world watches that, that's a Kiddush Hashem. That is a per powerful display of how God saved those that were loyal to Him. That's a Kiddush Hashem. That sells Judaism. People watching that say, okay, I want to be Jewish now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a Kiddush Hashem. But if the Jew dies, what kind of a Kiddush Hashem is that? 
God is not being sold well when a Jew dies for him. If they would die in that fire, who look? Who, which onlooker is going to say, "Oh, I want to subscribe to that"? Yeah, right. Sign me. <laughs> but, if every, but if everyone starts letting themselves, uh, what's the word? Uh, it still is a kiddush Hashem because at the end of the day, it shows. They fought. What it shows is the devotion of Jews. That's what it shows, and that alone is a kiddush Hashem. That God has such loyal people. So God comes out looking not so good in the way of getting new at it. You know, where were you? You know, why didn't you come to their aid? But it does send a powerful message about God and His relationship with these people. Or at least their relationship with God. You're awestruck when you see a Yid is ready to give up his life. We've spoken about Kiddush Hashem many times, and I've always emphasized, and I want to emphasize it today as well, that the true, I mean, you can find the idea of sacrificing your life for your belief by others, other religions also. I mean, look at all these Muslim terrorists. I mean, essentially, they're sacrificing their life for their belief. If you, if you really analyze it, that's what they're doing. So you could say they're also ready to give up their life for their religion, right? Mm -hmm. Or Christian, devoted Christians that have given up their life for their Jew, for their religion. This happens. Joan of Arc. Who? Joan of Arc. Yeah. That's exactly what you're saying. But she did it for religion. So is that unique to mm -hmm. Jews? Is that unique to Jews? The answer is that Kiddush Hashem is unique to Jews. Why? And with this I'll conclude. Mm. The Tanya says in chapter 18 and in 19 in many places, he talks about Kiddush Hashem, that a Jew is ready to sanctify his life for God. The, Ra the Alter Rebbe always says, a, even a Kal Shebekalim, a Kal Shebekalim is someone who is a, uh, uh, I don't want to say the word worthless, but lightheaded. The Alter Rebbe says a lightheaded Jew is ready to give up his life for Jews. I mean, they got a non religious Jew. And that is a specific mm -hmm. reference. Mm -hmm. Meaning, of course, if you're a religious, passionate, devoted, committed Jew, you're ready to give up your life for God. Just Christians would also be ready. Why? Why is a person ready to give up his life? A Christian that gives up his life, yeah? Or a Muslim, or even a religious a rabbi, a Jew, a devoted tzaddik. If he's giving up his life, why is he giving up his life? It could be. Because to him, that's life. What's he's, you're going to force him not to live like a secular person. He's not, that's not life to him. He'd rather not live. And that you can have by Christians also. They're so, their religion became so ingrained and part of their, their psyche and their, make, their personality that take it away from me, I'd rather die. And the same with the Muslim. Take my religion away, take away my life. It's the same thing. The al Rebbe says that one, th one unique thing we find by Jews by no one else. And that is that even Secular Jews are ready to give up their life for religion, and that's a that's a novelty. Why would a secular person give up his life for Judaism? You can say, "Wow!" In other words, when you look at a person that gave up his life for his religion, you say, "Wow, what a passionate Jew!" But if you think about, it, you analyze his behavior a day ago, a week ago, he wasn't even a religious person. So what happened over here? Why is he all of a sudden so passionate? To the point where he's ready to give up his life. Oh, this is a thing you find, it's a unique thing by Jews. I'm not saying it happens every day, but it has happened a lot of times in history with Jews that are very not devoted and religious on their day-to-day -day life. Suddenly when the test of faith came, they gave up their life. 
That's a uniquely Jewish concept because they have in the Shem. Same, but you're born a Jew. Once you're born a Jew, it's within you, even if you don't practice. Still, I know, but to the point where you're ready to give up your life for it. I don't know. That's a novelty. It's not yeah, so simple. Agree, but it's a very big novelty. You know, I'm born an American. Uh, you're not interested in American life. You're not going to give up your life for America. <coughs> And converted Jews also wasn't. Uh... So I'm saying that that's a unique thing because of it, because we have in the Shomis, So that's why we're connected to Hashem at that level where we can't even if we wanted to separate ourselves from God. But that's a separate issue. But the concept of v'chayba and to live by it, it there's, there's there's distinctions. Generally speaking, you have to live, not die for Judaism. But if you're threatened in a time of decree or in public, you always have to give up your life. If the person means to, to, to depress Judaism, if he's looking for a meal on Shabbos and he wants you to cook it, that's a different story. It's not, it's not a fight against God. It's a fight for his stomach. So give him his meal while you have to die. It's silly to die for that. But if there's a fight against God in the world, then you have to uphold God. You can't let yourself live and let the God die. You can't let yourself live and God should die. If the people of the world are trying to kill God, kill religion, kill Judaism, you're killing God, I'm not going to live and let the God die. God expects you to die and let him live. And that's the principle of here, of Kiddush Hashem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh,